So let's talk about muscle. This is a great question, by the way, from a comment um, from a previous video that I made. And it's a good one regarding hypertrophy, skeletal muscle hypertrophy, so getting bigger muscles, uh, and that in relation to athletes. And um, I'm going to just cover a few things here. <clears throat> one is, do you need, how much mass do you need? And two, what's the best way to go about it if you're an athlete? And, you know, athlete is obviously a vague term. Um, we can subdivide that into, you know, a certain sport that you play, the level of, of athlete you are. So are you talking about a junior high athlete in the United States or, you know, somebody's in middle school to a high school secondary education athlete, a junior college, college, four university division one athlete, like the highest levels of collegiate athletics here in the United States, um, a professional athlete, you know, a, a club sport athlete and, and the club sport can mean a lot of things that could be part of a professional system. There's so many things that can play in it. And this is, you know, one of two of my favorite words in this field. And I thought I was clever and came up with this, but um, I mean, it's not very clever words, but um, and others, I've heard others say it uh, probably because it's it's very obvious the more time you spend in this field. And that is it depends is so much that depends on the person and some of the things I just listed off. And so what I'm going to do is attempt to um, provide some guidance, perhaps, of how much hypertrophy is needed and then how to go about it maybe some methods there i'm not going to espouse one method to do it but i think it's important that there has there is a method of course because hypertrophy training muscle mass building is best done um it, well it is done through volume primarily and with high volume type of loads though or high volume type of training that incurs a lot of fatigue and so you have to properly manage when you do the hypertrophy training so let me back up just for a second who needs hypertrophy <clears throat> who needs bigger muscles? Well, you know, when we look at strength, if you look at any basic biology book, it'll, t it'll tell you that the cross-sectional area of a muscle is, uh, some books say, the only factor, and I, I don't think that's quite the case as much as it used to be, but is a primary factor when it comes to how much strength is exerted, and that there's no doubt about that. Now, the neurological system <clears throat> can, is highly trainable as well. Uh, like we usually talk about the first six to eight weeks of strength gains are due to neurological changes and not as much to hypertrophy. You know, hypertrophy starts pretty quickly, like the process starts immediately, just before you can see a significant amount manifest and potentially make a big difference in strength training. It takes a little bit of time. Um, <clears throat> I would argue that neurological portion of strength is a little bit more important in older athletes as well. Uh, I know it can be argued that hypertrophy is the only factor that's really going to change an athlete's performance in terms of strength later on in their career. And I don't disagree with that, but I, proportionally, I think that neurological changes still are occurring. Now, again, we're talking about once you get to that level of performance, let's say you've been competing in something and move, using the barbell to get better at that, or you're in a barbell sport, you've been competing for 15 years plus you know, it could be at that point you are still trying to gain some skeletal muscle hypertrophy, but if you're in a weight class sport, you don't want to gain too much. And so now you're working more on neuro factors, nutritional factors, psychological factors, uh, you know, tactical factors, whatever it may be to make you a better athlete. And there's a, actually some really interesting research, and it's not a surprise. Um, and, and back up for a second. And I say research in this case, not necessarily peer reviewed research. Th this is what I'm thinking anyway. There is some peer reviewed research to support this, but the particular thing I'm thinking about is from Vladimir Sirensberg. Um, block training um, and his reference to working with kayakers and how over time when an athlete gets older the time they spend the the, the amount of volume they spend in their training de decreases and that makes sense right because we know our recovery starts to diminish as we get older um, you know you see the same thing in uh, Anatoly Bounderchuk's work you know he produced a ton of tables correlations and again these are correlations but I think they're very interesting in the lesson shot putters one that sticks out of my mind is you know the the correlation to you know how far the shot could be put by an athlete at various stages in their training and the older they got the less important strength training in the traditional sense became in other words the back squat became less important or less correlated okay i don't make too big of an assumption here but less correlated so the correlation became uh, weaker over time as the athlete aged, meaning that there are other factors that became more important. So technical factors, again, experience, nutrition, managing nerves, uh, sleep, recovery, right? So many other factors. So I had to put it out there first is that, you know, when you talk about hypertrophy, is it needed or not? 
you know, again, it depends on who we're talking about. If we're talking about a young athlete and not necessarily biologically young, but just young in the beginning of, of training, um, hypertrophy is probably going to be a focus. Um, even if you're in a, a non-contact, non-collision sport, uh, you know, at least on paper, let's say a sport like soccer or football, right? We would argue that um, it's a contact sport. You fall, you're running other people, I mean, you just, you know, you're, you're competing for the ball. I wouldn't argue that it's, you know, a collision sport, but I would say sometimes, but I would say it's mostly a contact sport. Uh, but on the surface, you'd say, well, I mean, a lot of hypertrophy, you, know, you don't need that. Well, you know, if your legs get a little bit bigger uh, and your upper body gets a little bit bigger, then, you know, in terms of hypertrophy, then you should be able to move faster. How much hypertrophy, again, is going to depend on the individual. Um, some people are more type two fiber, and so they'll gain mass quicker, but that fiber also that type of fiber, muscle fiber, and or hybrid to, you know, the more you train, the less hybrid you have, but at least we think so. Um, the more of the type two fibers you have, the more of an endurance focus you might need to have. And so less hypertrophy focus, because these athletes, their main constraint may not be that they're super strong, but it may be that they're not as fit. And it comes to mind working with some elite rowers in the last few years. I remember one clearly, and elite rowers are traditionally more aerobic based athletes. That's what makes them really good. But there was an athlete that was more type two fiber and he struggled immensely. He could dominate in the weight room and all the strength movements were fantastic. And he made up for a lot of his inadequacies, if you will, in the aerobic world because he was strong enough. But when it came to, you know, making the Olympic team, that fiber type may hurt him. And that eventually cost him a place on the team. And you know, there's nothing he can do about that. That's, that's just genetics. Um, and you can argue, well, you know, he could do more cardio training. Well, when you're at that level of competition, like it or not, you can't work your way into that level, at least to a point. It's just, it doesn't work that way. As much as we all like to think that, it doesn't happen. You have to have genetic. I think most of us know that there has to be some genetic gifting in uh, whatever realm you're in, you know, whether it's an aerob anaerobic sport, power sport, or aerobic sport, um, in order to see success at the highest levels. Again, that's like, you know, I, me saying I'm going to be in the NBA not going to happen no matter how hard i try you know if i would have tried my hardest i might have played low level college basketball but you know, I'm, I'm a terrible basketball player i'm just saying that's um that's something i could work for but you know my genetics are going to limit me at some point okay so we have to look at that and say how much hypertrophy need? we're already a pretty muscular person this sport you're playing right now whatever it is maybe we don't need any more hypertrophy your strength levels are are far more advanced than what you need you're fast enough you know, maybe at this point, it's not about getting stronger. You know, you're squatting two times your body weight. Uh, we don't need more strength. We need to work more on the neurological side and being explosive, right? So again, this, it depends factor. <clears throat> In general, though, so with all that said, if the, if the athlete, we've concluded the athlete needs skeletal muscle hypertrophy. If it's a lower level athlete or beginning athlete that um, hasn't been trained, or training quite a bit, you can do concurrent type of training. So you can, you, know, you can have a day where you do more heavier loads, say in the lower repetition range with heavier loads to making sure you're not going to failure, of course. And then later in the week, do a volume type of training. So, you know, building volume over time, same thing. I would stay away from failure, even when these untrained people, it's unnecessarily accruing fatigue for no reason. And they won't accrue as quickly because they can't go to failure. They might get sore, but they won't accrue fatigue as quickly. But over time, the better training they get, the better they are recruiting. Uh, muscle fibers and so they will fatigue at a more rapid rate and so anyway early on you could do that concurrent type of thing where you are training both strength and hypertrophy at the same time because they're going to happen together anyway um, even if you do a little bit heavier loading you can even argue you don't need to do much heavier loading if it's like if you're talking about junior high kids i mean i don't you can do sets of four and three and two <clears throat> my argument would be is why why do that there's no reason to load their spines and do things like that, that type of loading when it's unnecessary. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just seems a little bit unnecessary to me. Um, I get concerned when I see these studies about elite athletes and I look more at weightlifting. There's only a few of them, but that are having back injury uh, issues as they age. And I see a lot of young weightlifters, Olympic style weightlifters lifting extraordinarily heavy loads properly and well coached. But sometimes I feel like excessively and unnecessarily early in their careers. And then over time, they're gonna have some back problems potentially. And I know people would argue with me about that. And I'm not a subscriber to the whole end of, you know, the, the growth plate fractures and all that. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about um, unnecessary loads too early in life. We have some research that concerns me in terms of lower back. And I'm talking about like traditional barbell work. 
if you select proper exercises too, like if you do a lot of dumbbell work and things like that, which tends to be more of that mid rep range, I think that's a better way to train young athletes, especially biologically young athletes um, and prepping them. Because again, it's one of those things like what's necessary? Is it necessary to back squat every athlete? Absolutely not. I love back squats. I love them, but they're not a good fit for everybody. And again, it's that depends factor. We have to use our mind, our brains a little bit. You know, even when I train remote clients, I do incorporate the back squat. Um, usually, you know, people are more experienced. Sometimes I'm incorporating people who are not as experienced, but I know they won't take the loads to excessiveness. And, you know, as much as I can ask for, I want to see them perform those exercises, right? Um, and equipment variability, if we can, you know, I'll keep them away from squatting with the barbell for a while if they have no experience in particular. And those are our common sense type of things. Okay, so for an, unex an inexperienced person, they can do both strength training and hypertrophy because it's going to happen anyway. They're going to gain the neurological response uh, adaptations and they're going to start building skeletal muscle hypertrophy. The fatigue level, as long as they're properly managed, meaning not going to failure all the time, should be fine. In fact, if you go to failure on some of those single joint exercises, it's probably just fine too, like biceps curls, lateral raises, things like that. Um, now, as the athlete becomes more experienced, this is when periodization needs to come into play. And I know periodization has been battered and bashed a little bit, but, you know, again, depends on the sport here. But if you can linear periodize, so just a simple old ramp, um, it's a great idea. That way you compartmentalize the high volume times. So you might, you know, you might do longer blocks too. you know, more than two weeks. Let's say you, in an ideal world, you have 12 weeks to train the athlete. You might do the first two weeks of. You know, this is a collegiate athlete, two weeks of hypertrophy, tissue prep, all this type of thing, and then you go to strength. Well, you might say, okay, well, I have a bunch of junior high kids. In fact, if it's say for some odd reason you have 12 weeks, which is very rare uh, because they're going to be playing other sports and, and anything else. But, you know, you may not need to periodize a junior high athlete. You probably can just use what I just described earlier, which would be a, just a simple ramp, right, in terms of volume and intensity as they go together concurrently. A few deloads here and there when you seem to get tired, but you don't have to overthink this. But if you feel like this, maybe put in a high school athlete, a more advanced high school athlete, like a senior in high school that's been training with you for you know two or three years, uh, or you're a high school athlete and you're ready to linear periodize, the ramp isn't working, you notice you're gaining, gaining fatigue rapidly and you're not seeing progress, then you can start to linear periodize. So you might look at it and say, I know I still need to gain some mass, though I'm not where I need to be in terms of size. And I think that's what's limiting my ability to generate more force. Um, and so you might spend, of your 12 weeks, you might spend six to eight of them still doing hypertrophy training. So training more like a bodybuilder now in all your lifts. You're going to be slow still. You're not going to see a lot of improvements in power, but you, you're smart and you know that the last four-week cycle, depending on who you are, again, this can be modulated up or down. So I'm not saying this has to be this way, but the last four-week cycle, that's when you're going to switch over to heavier loads and start to incorporate maybe some plyometric training, depending on the sport, the last two to three weeks. Now, that's not a lot, but you could treat that as a peaking activity going into your scenes and knowing that you're going to do more jumping and more sprint work as part of your sports um, practice. You, know, you could say, hey, I've got a, I'm have got, i pretty you know, muscular in terms of where I think I should be at this particular stage in my development. I'm going to switch and move back to hypertrophy to just a four-week cycle, and I'll spend the rest of the eight weeks doing more heavy loading as a focus and incorporate plyometrics or whatever you're going to do um, to improve power if needed earlier. So, you know, I wouldn't plyometric train for more than eight weeks at the very max. That's a long time and it had to be done properly. But, you know, four to six weeks for a plyometric program, in my opinion, others can argue that <clears throat> is fine, depending on the sport, um, you know, is a good place to start. So you might slide that, you know, earlier along with the strength training and make your transition from volume training to intensity training early on. Doesn't mean you don't do any volume training. It just means that you're spending more of your time with the intensity training. And I know the argument with linear periodization always was, well, if you you know if you gain these skeletal muscle, if you make these skeletal muscle gains and hypertrophy early, you know by the time you get to you know if you do two weeks of that and you're in week or four weeks as you would say, the last eight weeks you're going to start to lose some of that skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And that's why I said you could still pepper in some hypertrophy type sessions, some volume maintenance type sessions, if you're smart about where you put them. You might not do them every week though. You might do it every three weeks or right below before your deload week. So you might do your heavy testing earlier in the week. So if you're gonna test or that's your highest percentage work early in the week, and then you might do a couple workouts where you do some high volume work right before your deload. That would be a great place to put that. So you maintenance the hypertrophy, but you're not spending a ten tremendous amount of training volume on it in order to keep it going. There's only so much energy you know, reserve 
um, you know, when you talk about programming, I, I always use an analogy when I teach students, and I know I'm at 15 minutes, so hopefully you stayed with me. Um, when I teach students, to tell, tell them, you know, these old video games I used to play. I used to play video games, believe it or not, right? Uh, and you would like assign points to the athletes in the off season, right? I'm going to, you know, you may have five qualities. I'm going to sp spend my tokens on strength. So I'd spend X amount of tokens on strength, but I only have so many tokens. So I have to be smart how I spend my tokens. So if I want to build their endurance or their strength, whatever, I need to spend that wisely. And it's based upon their current numbers. And so that's the same thing with when we talk about humans. I'm some, it's very much simplified, but it's the same idea that I need to spend my tokens wisely. And you have to look at yourself and say, what do I need? Or if you're a coach, what do I need my athletes to gain right now? What would give them the biggest increase in performance? And for a younger athlete, biological and training age, most of the time it's gaining muscle mass, right? But if I get a gigantic power lifter that say come in, that's muscular and been training for 15 years and like, hey, I like to do Olympic style weightlifting. It's like, pff, how much hypertrophy do I need to do with this guy or this gal? It's just unnecessary. I might use some for a tissue prep, some work capacity training just to prepare, but I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on that. Um, if somebody's undersized and they jump a weight class or I, I, I know that that's what their limiting factor is or whatever it is, then I'm going to bulk them up. <clears throat> bulk them up and I'll spend the time on hypertrophy where I can. That makes sense. Now, obviously, I want to be doing hypertrophy training right before the season starts. Um, I'd want to have some transition to strength. Um, from most athletes, but even my junior high kids that say if my ramp, if I'm still doing volume training, that's reasonable when they start the season. Okay, because they're going to have to back off on their frequency of training anyway, likely as the season starts. And so, you know, they don't have a tremendous amount of fatigue anyway. And so they should be able to volume train almost all the way up to and, and yes, they're not as explosive as they could be, whatever, but they're going to practice their sport and see that transfer of training from the muscle mass they gained. I lingered and I'd worked at that strength or that uh, hypertrophy training for as long as possible because I knew I'd get the most bang for my buck and getting bigger muscles than I would necessarily lifting heavy weights at that point. Okay. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta look at the situation and adjust in different times of year. You might have a eight week stretch where you're like, I don't have any competitions for a long time. And then I can do eight weeks of this, have a some, couple weeks off or a week off, and then I can tra start into my traditional ramp up, which may include another week of hypertrophy, but then I move to strength. Okay, so lots of ways to do this. This is, you know, I made a video about the science and art of coaching. This is understanding the science and then applying and coaching and making decisions and making notes and, and being okay with adjusting on the fly. You don't have to stick with a program that isn't working. Uh, you can make adjustments as you go. Okay, I've talked too long. I, I thought I was going to make a five-minute video. Um, it's clear that I belong in academia because I'm just so long-winded. So um, I hope you found value in this video. It's an important question, um, and I didn't. I won't talk about it here just to make this a little bit less long. Um, but what if you have multiple competitions in a season? I alluded to that just a, a minute ago and saying you could look and see where the blocks are. Like you could trade long periods of time in volume if you thought that you needed that and you just plan accordingly. But you might not be able to do a ton of hypertrophy training as a block if you have a lot of competitions backed up one to another. You might have to pick and choose just single workouts where you can maintenance your volume um, in a particular extremity that you feel, you know, lower body or upper body, you know, whatever, you, you know, lower extremity, upper extremity, whatever you think is important to maintenance at that particular point, you can do that. If it's a lower extremity sport, you could spend more time doing volume in the upper body if you felt that was necessary for that sport improvement that athlete's improvement to gain more upper body mass you might do that so like your soccer player like they're getting you know pushed around on the field maybe you feel like that gaining some upper body mass might help them you're going to train their legs a little bit differently maybe more of a recovery type of approach because they're maybe in the middle of the season or whatever it might be but you're still pushing their upper body to gain muscle mass so lots of ways to do this it's a great question and it's a great question because there's a lot and um, you know I could talk about this forever and I'll, I'll stop here um, hopefully I haven't lost you already um, hope you watch to the end though and if it generates more questions put them in the comments below and I would happily respond to them subscribe to this channel um, I'm gonna put out more videos as we go and information you hope you find value